Since Keith Moore spoke on the subject of embryology in the Quran in the 1980s, Islamic proselytizers have claimed the Quran contains miraculous information on the subject of embryology that could not possibly have been known to humanity in the 7th century. In particular, one verse which describes how bones form before flesh has been touted as an example of miraculous information. The Quran's description of human development in the womb has become something of a revived subject since the biologist P.Z. Myers told Aira, a UK-based Islamic proselytizing group, that they had just proved the Quran to be scientifically incorrect in claiming that it describes bones forming before the flesh and that bones and flesh actually form simultaneously from mesenchyme. Of course, the Quran cannot possibly be wrong. Only our understanding of the words can be in error. Now, let us take a look at the information within the Quran and compare it to the information from Galenic medicine. Quran 23,13 Then we placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging. This shows an early stage of embryonic development where the human is still a seed. Galen says, the first i.e. stage is that in which is seen in both abortions and dissections. The form of the semen prevails. Quran 23 colon 14 Then we fashioned the dropper clot. Galen continues, now in the case of the semen voided in the sixth day, it becomes filled with blood. The next part of the Quran says, Then fashioned we the clot a little lump. Galen goes on to say, After it has been filled with blood, heart, brain and liver are still unarticulated and unshaped. The Quran follows by saying, Then fashioned we the little lump bones, then clothed the bones with flesh. Galen immediately goes on to say, After nature has made outlines of all the organs and the substance of the semen is used, thus it caused flesh to grow on and around all the bones. Here we see Galen's writings describe a fetus starting as semen. After six days it then fills with blood and the fetus starts to develop various bodily parts, but remains unformed. Then flesh starts to grow on and around the bones before the fetus goes on to become fully formed. So, what is so miraculous about the information in the Quran? Almost identical words were spoken by a man hundreds of years earlier who didn't need to claim divine intervention for their origin. Knowing that there is no point at which an embryo is a clot of blood, Islamic apologists tried to force the Quran to be accurate by using the following claims. Despite knowing there are numerous tafsirs explaining how this is a clot of blood. Number one. The Quran is merely saying the embryo looks like a clot of blood. There is nothing miraculous about saying what something looks like. These people used to kill and eat their animals themselves. It is not unimaginable that they sometimes discovered the animal had been pregnant and that the embryo looked like a clot of blood. Number two. The Quran describes the embryo looking like a leech. You need a microscope to see this. At no point does the Quran use the word resembles or looks like before the word alaka. Therefore the Quran would be saying that the embryo turns into a leech. To claim this is the meaning of the Quran is to claim the Quran is imperfect because it could be improved by adding the word resembles. Number three, the Quran is describing the way the embryo clings to the uterus. As with the Quran's vague stages of human development, this too was explained in Greco-Roman medicine long before Muhammad was born. Galen reports that the fetus is attached to the womb, just like fruit to a tree. Or number four, the Quran is describing the way the embryo lives off its mother's blood. Yet again, this alternative explanation was also described by Galen, as he described how the offspring takes nutriment from the mother's blood. Nutriment also comes through the chorion, from the veins and arteries of the mother. 
The fact that so many people claim different miraculous meanings for the same word alaka clearly shows that the meaning of this word is being inferred by the reader and then retrofit in an attempt to match reality. Of course the latest revival to this entirely bogus miracle claim has come about as a consequence of IERA ambushing the biologist and embryologist PC Myers at the World Atheist Convention in Dublin in 2011. During this interview Adnan Rashid told PC Myers Does Aristotle say the bones come first and then the flesh and the muscles? Is that what the Quran specifically says? Absolutely. And thus the Quran is a miracle. At which point PC Myers informed them that this is factually incorrect. You just demonstrated the Quran is wrong. These are forming simultaneously with each other. As expected the apologetic machine is now in full motion as the clear words of the Quran are examined closely in order to discern what they clearly said from the start whatever that might be as long as it matches reality. Lane's lexicon uses this very verse as an example of when the word ba is used to denote an absolute sequence so it seems Adnan's original interpretation may have been correct after all. I currently see the miracle claim possibly morphing into one of the following reinterpretations. Number one, the original miracle claim was correct, bones develop before flesh. I am not a biologist or an embryologist, so I cannot comment on the science. But if this does turn out to be the case, then the verse is not a miracle, because the text I quoted from Galen hundreds of years before the Quran also states that flesh grows on and around the bones. Number two, the Quran does not say, then we clothe the bones, but, and we clothe the bones. This certainly isn't a miracle, as replacing the word then with and removes any indication of sequence. As a consequence, the verse would be saying nothing more than, bones have flesh around them. And it takes no more intelligence than a child to know that your bones are clothed with flesh, just as our flesh is clothed with man-made fabrics. Number three, our original understanding of the Quran was incorrect. The bones and flesh form at the same time and then later the flesh attaches to the bones. The Quran's terse description of embryology does not say that the flesh moves onto the bones. Interpreting the words in this way is merely an extrapolation and an inference. But again this is no miracle. The word used for clothe also means to drape upon or to cover. We do not need to invoke the divine in order to say that bones are covered by flesh and thus by definition this does not match the criteria of a miracle because there is a much more mundane explanation for this text. Thus we do not need to invoke a supernatural power. The simple fact is that the words clothed the bones with flesh is a valid way to rephrase the words written by Galen hundreds of years earlier cause the flesh to grow on and around the bones. The question how did Muhammad miraculously only pick the Galenic teachings which were correct and leave out his errors is often used by Islamic apologists. That this counter argument has no bearing on the fact that we have already proven these verses are not a miracle is completely ignored. In a very short piece of text the Quran says the same thing that Galen said also in a very short piece of text and Galen was wrong. This miracle claim itself is an example of Muhammad copying incorrect information and an example of apologists reinterpreting the words to try to make them correct. Semen does not turn into a blood clot or leech. The sperm within the semen is a trigger for the woman's egg to start dividing. If an all-knowing being wanted to present us with a 20th century embryonic miracle, then why not mention the swimming thing within the semen? Why not mention the tiny egg within the woman that is invisible to the naked eye? And most importantly, why use words which look just like a paraphrasing of work authored by a mere human hundreds of years earlier. There are indeed other examples within the Quran 
of where its human author seems to have copied Greco-Roman medicine, which was wrong. In Surah Al-Insan, verse number 2, the Quran reads, Verily, we created man from a drop of mingled semen. Ibn Abbas is reported to have described this as that of the man being white and thick, and that of the woman being yellow and thin. Thus, progeny comes from both of them. al Jalalain say, that is from the fluid of the man and the fluid of the woman that have mixed and blended. Ibn Kathir explains that various people reported Amshaj is the mixing of the man's fluid with the woman's fluid. Islamic apologists will now try to claim that this verse itself is a miracle because it is saying that the fluid a man ejaculates is a mingled drop of semen and sperm. But this argument is weak. Of the material the male expels during sex, it is only the sperm within the semen which initiates the creation of the offspring. So to claim the Quran is saying that humans are made from a mingled drop of both sperm and semen would be to say the Quran is in error. Another common apologist approach is to claim that it is a male drop that mingles with the woman's egg. This is a huge leap of faith due to the fact that there is nowhere in the Quran which mentions a woman's egg and perhaps not coincidentally there is no mention of a female egg in Greek medicine either. However this apologist argument is also weak because again it is only the sperm which meets the woman's egg and not the semen. By no stretch of the imagination could the combination of a solid sperm and a solid egg be described as a drop of mingled fluid. The explanation of this verse that makes the most sense is the one put forward in the tafsirs and hadith where it is the fluid of the man meeting a woman's fluid that creates the offspring. According to this fatwa on the signs of puberty, the discharge of a woman that is expelled during sex is described as a thin yellow fluid. Following hadith details Muhammad explaining how the resemblance of an offspring is determined by which of the parents discharges first. The next one elaborates further and specifies that the fluid in question, which is discharged by the female, is the fluid she would expect to see during a sexual dream and is thin and yellow in appearance. It is likely that Muhammad heard of Galen's semen theory that the male and female sexual fluids mix together to form the fetus. Galen did not believe that the female semen was her menstrual blood. Galen writes, the similarity of offspring to their parents arises through a source common to both parents, but menstrual blood is not a source common to both male and female. The similarity of offspring to parents is either through semen or through menstrual blood, but it is not through menstrual blood, therefore it is through semen. Galen clearly thought that both male and female semen are produced during an orgasm, and that the woman's semen is visibly thinner than male semen. Galen writes, when therefore the female produces semen at the same time as the male, the semen discharged through each of the two horns and carried to the middle of the hollow of the uterus coats the passages and at the same time reaches the male semen. It mixes with this semen and the membranes are entwined with each other. The female semen provides this service for the fetus and becomes, as it were, a kind of nutriment for the semen of the male, for it is thinner than the male semen and colder. If there is any doubt that the discharge mentioned in the preceding hadiths were about vaginal lubricant, then the following hadith explicitly linking a wet dream directly to this discharge should clear up the matter, especially as it also identifies this discharge as being the same fluid which makes her offspring resemble her. Um Salaam said, O oh Allah's Apostle, verily Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. Is it essential for a woman to take a bath after she has had a wet dream? He said, Yes, if she notices discharge. On that Um Salama laughed and said, Does a woman get a nocturnal sexual discharge? He said, 
How then does her son resemble her, his mother? Verily, we created man from a drop of mingled semen. Quran 86 verses 6 to 7 He was created from a fluid, ejected, emerging from between the backbone and the ribs. As the tafsirs explain, the fluid is that which is emitted from between the backbone of the man and the ribs of the woman. The problem with this is that again it mirrors Galen's erroneous mixing of fluids. Female fluid excretions do not form part of the embryo. Apart from that, the part of the male which causes reproduction is the sperm, which is created below the penis. To be correct, the Quran would have to say that we are all created from what is within the fluid. Apparently, there was confusion in ancient times as to whether the testes or the kidney was the source of semen. The Romans gave up and called the kidneys renes, from which we take our adjective renal. Either way you look at this verse, it appears to be a copy of one of Galen's erroneous writings. But how could Muhammad have known? This of course is an argument from ignorance. I don't know the answer to X, therefore I do know the answer to X, and the answer is... Insert unfounded belief of your preference here. It is also a completely irrelevant question. The mere fact that other humans knew this information means that it was within the sphere of knowledge of mankind. What we do know is that an individual could have known this information whether we know how they came into possession of that information or not. IERA have been announcing for a number of months that their new research into these verses of the Quran have not only proven to be correct but, probably not surprisingly, have turned out to be even more accurate than originally thought. It seems that Hamza Zorsis has already started to release snippets on his website. One of these snippets attempts to disassociate Muhammad from Hellenistic medicine by claiming that one of his companions, Harris ibn Kalda, could not have learned Greek medicine at John de Shapur, because no such medical academy existed. The following quote is from the website hamzazorsis.com John de Shapur was certainly a meeting place for Arab, Greek, Syriac and Jewish intellectuals but there is no evidence that any medical academy existed there. Only in the early 9th century did Arab Islamic learning medicine take shape. The first obvious point to make here is that even if this argument did disprove the notion that Harris ibn Calder learned Greek medicine from John de Shapur, it does not prove that he didn't learn it somewhere else. It also doesn't rule out the possibility that Muhammad heard some very basic embryology concepts from someone like Harris ibn Khaldun's adopted son, Al-Nazar, who was Muhammad's cousin and also who allegedly travelled to increase his knowledge and was a medical physician like his adopted father. It doesn't rule out the possibility that Muhammad's doctor gave him a brief overview one day while they were discussing the apparent miracle of pregnancy or that a friend told Muhammad what his doctor had told him during a trip to the doctor with his pregnant wife. Putting forward a list of everyone to have ever come into contact with Muhammad who either was a physician, had ever talked to a physician, or had ever talked to someone who had talked to a physician, and so on, would not only be impossible, but would also be pointless. For the embryonic verses in the Quran to be considered a miracle, we must concede that the only way Muhammad could have come across such information must have been via a divine entity. The book by Roy Porter, cited by Ayera, is not the only one claiming that Jundishapur was not a great medical academy. We have no persuasive evidence for the existence of a medical school or a hospital at Jundishapur although there seems to have been a theological school and perhaps an infirmary. If there was an infirmary at John de Shapur, then it is still possible that an individual such as Harris ibn Calder may have learned additional medical knowledge whilst working there, but really this is utterly unimportant. David Lindbergh continues, The story 
must not be oversimplified to the point where the diffusion of Greek learning is viewed as hanging on the slender thread of Nestorian activity in the city of John de Chapur. Rather, we must see this as a widespread movement of cultural diffusion, whereby the aristocracies of Western and Central Asia assimilated broadly and deeply, and by a variety of mechanisms. To assume that John de Chapur was the crucial point from which Greek medicine was disseminated throughout the region is clearly an error. The diffusion of Greek medicine throughout this region and the rest of the world was a slow but long process lasting many centuries, ensuring that it became part of cultures across the globe. But the book by David Lindbergh is not the only one that reaches this conclusion. If only Aira had spent some time reading the book they cited, rather than simply quote mining it, they would have learned a whole lot more on the subject of the dissemination of Greek medicine throughout history. And they possibly would have realised that their point about Harry Sibben Calder was somewhat pointless. Even though Greek medicine had not yet taken shape, as early as 1700 years before Muhammad was born, the Greeks were already travelling as far as Egypt. Greek medicine was an open system available to anyone to learn, which contributed to its development. By the 4th century BCE, Aristotle had been appointed as teacher to Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's conquests brought Hellenistic knowledge as far as Egypt, the Persian Gulf and Sicily, and led to the creation of the Library of Alexandria. A large collection of medical documents attributed to Hippocrates were available in the Library of Alexandria as early as 250 BCE. In the 1st century CE, anatomy was being taught in the Library of Alexandria. In approximately 145 CE, Galen himself studied at the library. After Galen died, Greek medicine remained mostly unchanged. By 324 CE, Constantinople, Byzantine, was a Hellenistic safe haven. 344 CE, Christian hospitals spring up throughout the region. Leontius, Bishop of Antioch, from 344 to 358, set up hostels in his see, around 360 of them. Pre-640 CE, it was still possible to learn Greek medicine, and specifically Galenic medicine, in Alexandria. But the best has certainly been saved for last. By AD 500, in Alexandria, there was not only a syllabus of Hippocratic texts, those which Galen followed, but an embryonic Galenic canon, which became known as the Sixteen Books, taught with commentaries and studied in a set order. Alexandrian scholars also summarised the Sixteen Books for ease of memory. For over 1700 years, Greek culture and knowledge had been infusing itself slowly and thoroughly into the culture of the Middle East. Only 70 years before the birth of Muhammad, 16 books by Galen on the subject of embryology had not only been canonised at the Library of Alexandria, but they had also been summarised by scholars in order to make them easier to commit to memory. Knowledge of Greek medicine, and in particular Galenic medicine, remained prevalent throughout the region for many years after Muhammad's death. During a concerted effort to collect Greek medicine and translate it into Arabic, in the 9th century it was still possible to find many of Galen's writings throughout the Byzantine Empire. This is most likely what David C. Lindbergh was referring to in his book when he remarked how Jundi Shapur was not the slender thread by which Greek medicine was spread. When reviewing the evidence presented, the question we should ask should not be how could Muhammad have known, but rather how could Muhammad not have known?